How is it going guys and welcome to the Olufemi channel. We're a group of teachers that want to shore up your video production skills in as little time as possible. Yo, it's Herman here and today we're going to learn how to use After Effects. We'll be deciphering the interface and equipping you with the basic tools you'll find yourself using the most when you're in the program. So if you just downloaded After Effects and it's your first time launching it or, you know, you're just curious about what it can do, then this video is a great place to start. So what is After Effects? It's a visual effects, motion graphics and compositing software by Adobe. It's used by many filmmakers in post-production when producing film, TV shows, or web videos. But how does this differ from programs like Premiere Pro or Final Cut? Now, those programs are meant for efficiently editing your videos on a timeline, while After Effects is focusing more on the visual effects side of things uh, in post-production. So instead of focusing on placing clips side by side and cutting video, After Effects behaves more like the Photoshop of video editing in which you combine a bunch of videos or images into one scene. So you wouldn't want to edit a long video or film in After Effects. Now, by the end of the video, you'll learn how to make a sick motion graphic like this and track it to whatever object you like. We'll also learn how to replace the graphics and make variations. Now, because we'll be covering all the essential tools as we make this, it'll actually feel kind of like 10 tutorials in one because of how condensed all the content is. But don't worry, even though there's a lot to go through, I'll be breaking everything down in a way that won't be overwhelming for you. And if you'd like to use the footage and the project file that I'm using for this tutorial, then you can download it in the description below so that you can follow along. The version of After Effects I'm using is CC version 18.2, so make sure that yours is up to date uh, before following along. With all that said, buckle up, grab a coffee, and it's time to launch After Effects. Now, when it first opens up, you can create a new project or open previous projects. As you can see, there are some recent projects that can open up as well. And you can always just close the window and start from here. Oh boy, you might find it intimidating with all the windows and symbols and geez, there's just so many of them. But don't worry, you don't need to know everything from the get go. Think of the 80-20 rule. So 80% of what you'll be producing in After Effects will be from 20% of the tools and techniques that you'll learn. So I'll be guiding you through all the ones that you'll find yourself using the most often. Let's look over here on the top left panel. This is the project panel. As you can see, it says project up top over here on the top left. And it's where you will be organizing the things that you import and the compositions that you create. Now to import, all you have to do is either double click on an empty space over here, and then you can just browse through to find your file and then import it right over here with this button. Or an easier way is to bring in your window just like this with the clip. And all you have to do is just drag and drop it right over here to the project panel. And then just like that, it's imported into your project. Now, it's important to make a habit of staying organized when you're first starting out because the longer that you work in After Effects, the more files and compositions you'll have. And if you keep things organized, it'll be easier for you to find certain things or make changes. And a great way to do so is by creating folders. And what you can do is just click this icon over here. It looks like a folder icon. And when you hover over it, a uh, nice little message will say that it's to create a new folder as well. So these are really helpful if you're ever hovering over things and you're not too sure what they do. So in this case, we're gonna create a new folder and then you can just write something like footage and you just put that in over here. And then now you have that. And I suggest that you make a new folder for different things. You are going to thank yourself later for developing this habit. We're now going to make a new composition, which is basically a container for you to layer multiple files and composite your scene. Now there's a few ways that you can do this. You can either drag your clip right over here, over into an empty space down over here, which is your timeline. And once you let go, it'll just create a new composition for you based off the resolution and the frame rate of the clip. I'm gonna hit Control Z so I can undo that. And I'll show you another way that you can make a new composition. You can also drag it over to this icon over here, which is to create a new composition. And that's another way to do so. And if you're wondering why you would want to do that, it's in case that, you know, you have multiple compositions already open and then you don't have this empty space that you can drag your footage in. So I'll control Z to undo that and I'll show you a third way. And that's up top over here under composition. You click that once and then hit new composition, which the shortcut is control N if you don't want to click around everything and you want to use keyboard shortcuts, which is also a great habit to develop. And then now you have this window with composition settings that you can change. First, let's just change it to, I don't know, main comp like this. That'll be our main composition that we're working with. And over here, we can change the resolution of the composition. In this case, it's 1080 by 1080, which is not quite what we want. We want the width to be 1920 
by 1080, which is matching the resolution of the clip. The frame rate you can change as well. Now, most people in you know film, uh, they'll use 23.976 frames per second. It's pretty much standard. So if you don't know what frame rate you want to output or you're working for a client and they don't tell you what frame rate they want, this is a pretty safe one that you can just use. Resolution is set to full. You can leave that. And then all this, you can just leave on its own. Now, duration is the length of the composition that you're going to be working in. So in this case, it's at 20 seconds. So it's 20 and then zero, zero frames. So we'll just leave it at that for now and we'll hit OK. And we can always change this later. And how you would do that is by hitting Control K. That's a shortcut to bring up the composition settings again. So if you ever want to change your mind and change any of these parameters, you can just hit Control K and that'll bring up your composition settings. OK. So what we'll do is drag this clip over to this composition. As you can see in the tab, it's our main composition that we just created. And over here where the clip is sitting, this is called the timeline. And if you come from a video editing program like Premiere Pro or Final Cut, this should look pretty familiar. Every composition has its own timeline where you can start building your scene, play what you have, or go to a specific frame of the video. So all you have to do is drag this playhead over here, this blue line, and you just drag it and you can scrub through and watch through the video. And it's all under the power of you dragging this blue line. Isn't that crazy? Now this light blue block over here is the video clip that you just dragged in, right? And this is called a layer. Now, whatever you slap into your timeline will be a layer. And these layers will stack up vertically to build your composition. Now they can be rearranged up and down as if you're placing one thing on top of another. Now I'm just gonna duplicate this so you can understand what's going on. I'm gonna hit Control D to duplicate it. And now you can see that I have a copy of the video clip and I just want to show you what layers are and how they work so you can rearrange them up and down so I'll just call this top layer and we'll call this bot layer and renaming is as simple as just clicking on the layer hitting enter and then you can change the name or you can right click it and then hit rename it's up to you so they can be rearranged up and down so if I just hold on to the top layer and then just drag it down over here and let go then as you can see the top layer goes to the bottom and then the bottom layers on top. So they switch places. Now what you can also do with layers is you can move them side to side and that'll determine when it will be played. So this top one right over here, I'm just going to move it over here and just like that. You can see that once I scrub through this and we're playing through the first video, it'll play again because the top layer is right over here. So this is your timeline. It plays linearly from left to right, right? and then it plays into the second copy of the video. So that's how layers kind of work. I'm just going to delete that one and I'll rename this one to footage like this, just for now. Now you can also trim your layers by dragging either ends of the layer like this. So if you can see that there's this kind of like two arrows right over here facing left and right, that means that you can trim the layer. So from the left side over here, I can have it kind of like that. And that way, this uh, more opaque kind of a more solid looking part of the layer is when you can actually start seeing the layer. And you can do the same thing on the right side as well. Let's say that I want to end the clip kind of around here instead of all the way over here. I can just drag the right side over here by just clicking and holding it down while it's showing the two arrows like this. And then while holding it down, I'm going to let go on when I want to trim it to. And just like that, it'll stop playing right over there. So that's how you trim layers. Now, if you find that your clip is very long and you don't want to keep dragging with your mouse and everything, then you can always use the keyboard shortcuts, which is a great way to save time. And for this one, to trim the left side, you can hit Alt, left bracket, and it'll trim it to wherever your playhead is. And in this case, let's say that I want to trim it over here on the right side. I can hit Alt right bracket, and that's how you trim the right side. So Alt left bracket, Alt right bracket are the shortcuts for trimming your layers. So now that we know how to do that, I'm just going to extend these back so that we haven't you know, modified the clip in any way. And speaking about layers, let's talk about all these lovely buttons over here that can be a little bit intimidating at first since we don't know what they are. Now start on the left side. Those are the ones that are more important right now. And the left one, which is the eye icon, uh, basically is the visibility icon. So if I turn that off, so it's you know, not filled in like this, then it hides the layer. So we can't see it anymore. Press the eyeball again, and if it shows up, we can see it. So this one is to mute or unmute the track. In this case, there's no sound, so you don't have to worry about it. Now the one right next to it, that's a circle. If I click that, you're gonna notice that nothing changes. And that's because it is to solo the layer. So if you have multiple layers in your composition, if you click that, it'll only show the ones that are marked with a dot over here and that's soloing the layers. So the one right next to it over here looks like a lock. 
that's the locker layer. So if I click it, it'll flash this kind of gray uh, flash, I guess. And it tells you basically, hey, your layer's locked, can't move it around, you can't touch it. So that's what it does, it locks the layer. So I'm gonna unlock that so I can still you know, play around with this layer. And that's all you need to know for now for layers. So we now know what layers are. Um, going back to this timeline and this composition, uh, you'll notice that if I play this through, it's black because this video clip only goes up to, you know, right over here, uh, six seconds and 16 frames. And that's what this is, by the way, this is your time code. It'll show where your player head sits on your timeline. So anything past that, as you can see, because the video clip is only that long, uh, it's only, you know, it's empty. You don't see anything. And if we don't need all this extra space, what we can do is move this uh, work area, just like that. So I go to the very end right over here and it's kind of like, think of it kind of like a layer. Now I can just drag the right side all the way over here, kind of like that. And basically what it'll mean is that it will render everything that is within this uh, work area. Now, if I want to trim the entire composition to fit into this duration of this clip or this uh, work area, what I can do is number one, use what I taught you where I changed the composition settings to match the duration of the video clip. But a faster way actually is to right click on the end right over here and then hit trim comp to work area. And as the name suggests, it'll trim the composition to the work area. And that's a fast way to trim the composition to fit to your work area so that this video clip right now fits nice and snug in the timeline. Now let's talk about what's up here. Now this window is called the preview window and it's where you actually watch back whatever's in your timeline. And that's what we've been using to watch this video clip. It's whatever's in our timeline right now and it's only this video clip. Now there's a few things I wanna go over on the preview window, starting from the very left side of this window. You can see that it says 50%. If I hover over it, it tells you what it is. It's the magnification ratio pop-up. And what that means is that it'll show you how big the video clip will be to preview. So in this case, this is 50% of the actual clip. So if I click it, I can change it to, you know, different percentages right over here, or I can go and hit fit up to 100%. So that way, if I drag the ends uh, or like the borders of the panel like this, and I can move things around, it'll always you know, try to be as close to 100%. So if I bring that down, it'll always fill up this panel. And just like how I showed you earlier in terms of dragging around this so that I can move how big uh, certain panels are, you can do that with all panels. So as long as you see an edge between your panels, so this is the project panel, this is the preview window. And this line over here, right in between, it'll show you this kind of symbol. And that'll mean that you can hold down and drag left and right, top and bottom, so they can extend certain panels. I know I'm sidetracking a little bit, but let's go back to over here on the preview window on the right side. This is uh, set to full right now. And this is the resolution that uh, you can see for the video clip. So right now it's at full resolution. Now, if you feel like when you play back your clip, it's a little bit laggy because you have a slower computer or maybe you have a really big file, then you can make it a little bit easier for your computer by clicking this and then changing it to you know half resolution or third resolution or even a quarter. And in this case, if I were to change it to half, as you can see, the quality drops down just a little bit, not too noticeable right now. But if we were to change it to quarter, for example, as you can see, it looks, you know, much more low quality and that's a quarter resolution. So in this case, we're going to go back to full button right over here with the lightning bolt with the uh, square is fast preview. Now, if you want to watch back in full resolution, all you have to do is just keep it on off. And as you can see in parentheses, it says final quality. And this is the final quality of the composition when you're playing it back. The one underneath over here is adaptive resolution. So if I click that and I were to drag it left and right. Now, right now, my computer is having no problem handling this footage and playing it back in real time. But if you're working on a slower computer or you know your hardware is having a little bit of uh, trouble processing this footage and the fans are worrying and it's starting to sound like a lawnmower, then you might want to have adaptive resolution on. And basically what that means is when you're scrubbing through like this, then it'll dumb down the resolution. So it'll end up looking kind of like this while you're scrubbing through it. And then when you kind of let go, then it'll go back to the full resolution. So basically what it means is that it'll automatically adjust the resolution of your preview. So in this case, we can keep it off. So it shows the final quality. Fortunately, my computer can handle it. Now right over here is the toggle transparency grid. I love these little pop-outs and how they remind me the actual name for these buttons. And when I click this, it'll show me the transparent parts of the composition. Now in this case, because this footage is fitting up the entire composition, you can't tell the difference. But if I were to make this video smaller or if I were to just move it off to the side like this, and all I'm doing is just dragging it over and just, you know, just clicking it down and then holding it and dragging it over, you can see that this area is black right now. Now this part doesn't have anything, but it's actually transparent, but by default it shows black. 
So if I click the toggle transparency grid, it'll show me this grid instead of the black. So I know for sure that this isn't a you know black video or a black solid or something, and it's actually transparent. So in this case, I'm gonna hit Control Z or Control Z, depending on where you are. And we'll toggle that off because right now it doesn't matter. Now the rest of the buttons over here in these symbols, uh, you can hover over them like I showed you before and you can see what they're called. But in this tutorial, we're actually not going to go over these because they're not the most crucial things to learn as a beginner. Except for this one. This one's kind of important when you're trying to line up things. Uh, this will basically show you some grids like this. If I hit grids, as you can see, there are these green lines like this, which is called a grid. And we can use this as reference when we're trying to line things up. Now you have some other options over here as well. Instead of grid, I'm going to uncheck that. And then we can go to proportional grid and it'll show me these wider grids. In this case, we're going to uncheck them since we don't really need them. So that is the preview window. Let's go back to the timeline over here and we're going to talk about the core tools and parameters you'll be changing for your layer. So on your layer, if you see this arrow that's facing the right right now, if I click that, it'll kind of drop down some more options for you. In this case, we're going to go to transform, click that arrow. It'll show me these tools over here, and these are going to be really important when you're animating or changing anything about a layer. Now let's go from bottom to top, actually. So starting from opacity over here, opacity means how transparent the layer will be. So right now it's at 100%, that's 100% in terms of being opaque. And then if I bring that down, it'll be more transparent. Now, if I were to toggle the uh, transparency grid like this, you can see that, you know, it's kind of fading into the grid, showing that it is uh, becoming more transparent. So I'm just going to turn that back off. And that's what that means. Right on top is the rotation. And if I were to click on this number with the degree icon over here, and I were to drag it right or left, as you can see, it'll pivot the layer to however many degrees that I show. I'm just going to hit control Z to undo. And then right on top is the scale. And that'll change the scale of the layer, which basically means how big the layer will be. So by default, it'll be at 100%. But if you want to make it bigger, like 136% like this, then you can zoom in and increase the scale like that. Or you can lower it and make it smaller. And then the position over here will change the position of the layer. So the left side over here, the 960, that's your X axis. So you can move it left or right. And all I'm doing is I'm clicking down on the number and I'm dragging the mouse left or right to move it. Or the Y axis right over here, that says 540 right now, I can drag it left or right to move it up and down. Another way for you to simply move the position is like I showed you before, you can just click onto the layer and then you can just drag it around. And the one on top that says anchor point uh, basically means where kind of the pivot point of your layer would be. So the anchor point is right here on the center over here and it looks like a crosshair like so with a circle in the middle. And what you can do is actually move that by hitting Y to bring the anchor point tool and you can hold it down and click and move this anchor point to a different location. And I'm going to show you as an example uh, what it does. So I'm going to move it all the way to the right side over here. So the anchor point is now on the right side of the layer. And if I were to, you know, change the rotation, it'll rotate from that point instead of the center, as you can see. And then if I change the scale and make it smaller, it'll scale down based off that point instead of from the center. So as you can see, it's collapsing closer to the right or expanding from the right side. So I'll hit Control Z so that the anchor point is back in the center. And then if I want to go back to the selection tool where I can you know, click things and move things around, I can just hit V. That is the shortcut for the selection tool. And we'll be going over a little more about these tools and these shortcuts uh, later. But while we're in the timeline, let's talk about keyframes. Keyframing is the backbone to animating any of your layers. They're basically uh, little markers that tell the layer what should happen at what time. For example, I'll go to the beginning over here and then I'm going to keyframe the position. So I'm going to animate the position of this layer. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to hit the stopwatch over here next to position. Now, as you see, everything that you can keyframe will have a stopwatch next to it. But I'm going to click the one that's right next to the position. If I click that once, it'll create this kind of like diamond, as you can see, and it's blue. And then it'll also show this as well on the left side. And then I can drag my playhead forward to you know about one second like this at one second i want to move the layer so that it is to the right over here all the way to the right and just a quick tip if you want to keep it straight while you're dragging it and you don't want it to kind of like go lopsided or anything like that you can hit shift and it'll automatically stay on the axis that you're dragging so in this case i just want to animate it so it's completely out of frame just like that and i'm going to go to the very beginning and if i hit spacebar to play it back 
it just kind of moves out of frame like this. So what I'm basically doing is I'm telling this layer that at the zero time code right over here, it's going to stay in this position. And then over at one second, as you can see in the time code, it moves all the way to the right out of frame. And everything in between is automatically filled so that it moves all the way over to the final position. So if I move you know, forward into time and then I were to drag this back over here to uh, the composition like this, and now I have three keyframes. First one telling me that it should start in this position, second one it moves out of frame, and then it goes back over to the left. And that's how you keyframe in After Effects. Now I'm just gonna hit the stopwatch once more. Now right now it's highlighted blue, but if I click that, it'll delete all my keyframes. And I wanna show you that this isn't limited to just the position, but literally any parameter and effect in After Effects that you can see has a stopwatch. So if at this point I want to change the scale, I hit the stopwatch over here, and then in the very beginning, let's make it, you know, like, 43%, 41% like this. And if I were to hit spacebar to play it back, it'll grow bigger all the way to the final scale of 100. While we're talking about keyframes, I wanna talk about easy easing your keyframes. Now, if you highlight your keyframes like this, so that they're highlighted blue, as you can see, and I hit F9, what this does is it'll easy ease your frame. And what that means is it'll smoothen out the motion between your keyframes don't look as sharp. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison between two animations where one is easy eased and one isn't. And this is one of those things that I didn't first learn when I was getting into After Effects, but I really wish that I did because it makes you know your motion not look as cheesy. So it'll kind of feather out that movement. So basically it'll slowly ramp up and then it'll slowly fade and feather out the motion. So that comes to not the sudden stop, but a nice smooth gradual stop. And if I were to click one of the keyframes and I hit this icon over here, this is the graph editor. Now, honestly, I actually don't know too much about the graph editor, but I do use it a lot for this particular purpose. So if I click that while a keyframe is highlighted that I've already converted to an easy ease frame, I can see the two keyframes right over here, the one on the right, and the one on the left, right? And I can take the handles over here and I can drag it over like so, Oop. making sure that it's aligned like this. And then if I were to play it through like that, basically it ramps up in speed like this, and then it'll come to a slow gradual stop as you can see. Now I can also drag the handle on the left keyframe right over here, like so, and then it'll gradually speed up and then gradually slow down. So this hump over here, this hill, is basically when it will speed up. And if you don't see this right now after hitting the graph editor and you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, all you have to do is click this uh, icon over here, the choose graph style and options, and it's right next to the eye icon and next to this one over here. If I click that, just make sure that the edit speed graph is check marked. So in this case, it already is, so I don't need to worry about it, but if yours isn't, then make sure that you choose that. All right, and that is how you keyframe things. Like I said, it's the backbone of animating things in After Effects, and you now know also how to smoothen out the keyframe. So I'm just gonna go to the end over here where it's 100%, and then I'm just gonna hit the stopwatch so that it stays at 100% and nothing's animated anymore. So let's hop over to the main toolbar where all these lovely symbols are that we don't know what they do right now, but don't worry, we're gonna walk through at least the ones that you're gonna be using the most often. Now this first one is the home icon. Uh, basically, if I click that, you don't need like you you don't really need this. This is brings this back over here, and uh, the one next to it is the main tool that we'll be using a lot, and it's the selection tool. And remember that the shortcut for that I mentioned was V, and basically that lets me you know select things. <laughs> like I can I can press and select different objects. So that's what the selection tool is. The hand tool, and I can basically just grab things and I can move things around. It's, it's an actual hand, and I can grab things around. So as you can see, I'm grabbing onto the timeline and I'm just dragging it around so that I can grab it left and right and pull it around basically. But I never really click the hand tool up top over here. What I like to do is I just hold on to space bar and that gives me the hand tool and then I can just drag things around. So that's a shortcut, basically making this button kind of useless for me. But um, the one next to it, the zoom tool, is another tool that I don't use very often because um, if I click that, I can basically have this magnifying glass and I can just click once and it'll you know magnify closer so it zooms in. And I can also hold onto Alt, and then it'll show this subtract icon on the magnify tool. And if I click that, it will, uh, you know, zoom back out. But like I said, I never use this tool because all I have to do is just scroll up with my mouse wheel, and that'll do the exact same thing. Same thing for the timeline over here, but the only difference is that I need to hold Alt. So if I hold down Alt, and I scroll up and down, I can zoom closer into the timeline or zoom out to the timeline. Now, if I wanna fine tune that magnification, I can also use my mouse and drag this. So this smaller kind of like mountain, two triangles, I'm not sure what it is actually, uh, means that it will be zooming out and then the right side will zoom in. So if I drag that dot over, it'll zoom in closer to the timeline 
and I can zoom back out like that. But what I do most of the time is just hold Alt and I use my mouse scrolly wheel up and down. So back to the main toolbar, these ones that are grayed out right now, we're not gonna be covering in this tutorial since you don't really need to use them. And then this one, this rotation tool, uh, if I click that, Basically what that does is it allows me to rotate layers like this, but that's another tool that I basically never use because when I'm rotating things, I just like to change it on the layer right over here as I mentioned before. The anchor point tool was the one that we went over before where the uh, shortcut for that is Y. So I can move the anchor point as you can see like this, right? Just by holding it and dragging it around. I'm just gonna go back to the center over here. And while we're talking about anchor points, I want to uh, give you a quick shortcut that is quite important if something like this happens to you where the anchor point is like, you know, somewhere out of whack, like it's just right over here on the right side uh, and we don't want that. So what you can do is hit the shortcut, Control Alt Home on your keyboard and it'll bring the anchor point to the center of the layer, just like that. So you don't have to drag it and, you know, guess that it's in the middle. And let's say that your you know, footage is somewhere over here. You can actually hit the shortcut Control Home and then bring the layer to the center based off where the anchor point is. So when you're moving a bunch of layers around, these could be really important shortcuts for you to use. Okay, but that's enough about the anchor point and the anchor point tool. Uh, the one right next to it is the rectangle tool, but this is actually kind of your uh, shape tool. And you can change this by holding down on the icon instead of just clicking it once. So if I hold it down, it'll show this menu over here. So we have the rectangle tool, we have the rounded rectangle tool, the eclipse tool, the ellipse tool, the polygon tool, and the star tool. Now I'm not gonna go through each and every one of these, but basically these are the different shapes that you can create while you're holding down this icon. So if I hold down and I let go on the rounded rectangle tool, for example, then I have that selected and I can draw a rounded rectangle. Now we'll be having some fun and drawing some shapes later. So I'll get back to this in a moment, but let's talk about the one right next to it. That is the pen tool. And if I click that, basically I can draw certain points and I can either draw a shape or I can draw a mask. But in this case, we're gonna talk about that again later. Uh, this one is the horizontal type tool. And basically when I have that big T selected, I can click on an area on the composition and I can start typing things like tutorial oh, if I can spell oh my and that is basically what it is it creates this new layer on your composition which is a text layer that you can you know change your text and we'll be talking about that a little more later as well when we're actually making some stuff right next to it is the brush tool and then we have the clone stamp tool eraser tool rotor brush tool and so on like these are tools that you're not going to use as a beginner, but they're very powerful tools for very specific things that you'll learn later on. And like I said, if you need to, you know, learn these tools and actually use them, you can hover them over like this and you'll know the name of them. In this case, the eraser tool and you can do some further research on it. So we're not going to be covering them today in this beginners after effects tutorial. All right. I hope that your brain isn't fried because we covered quite a bit so far, a lot of buttons, and we know what most of these tools and buttons are. So let's get into more of the fun part. And and actually start creating stuff. First thing I want to do is I want to hide the visibility of this layer because we don't need to worry about it right now. Uh, we're going to actually go over here and quiz time. What is this tool over here that I'm hovering? All right, not much of a quiz when it pops up like that, but uh, we're going to use the rounded rectangle tool. Uh, and if you can't find that, as I mentioned before, you can hold it down and it'll give you this menu and you can just let go onto the shape that you want to create. In this case, the rounded rectangle tool. And while you have one of these shape tool selected, you'll have these parameters right over here on the right. You'll have a fill and a stroke. Now fill is basically whatever uh, is filled into your shape. Stroke is the outer edge of the shape. So it's basically the outline. So if I click fill, just the name over here and not this empty space, if I click that, it'll give me these fill options. The first one is, you know, no fill. So there's not gonna be anything uh, filling the object. The one next to it is a solid color. So it'll fill it with a solid color. The one next to it is linear gradient and then radial gradient. So this will create gradients in your shape. In this case, I'm just gonna show you what it looks like if I were to choose a solid color. And then I'm just gonna hit okay, like this. And then make the stroke, you know, nothing like this. And then if I wanna change the color, I can click this, uh, box with the color and the shape fill color window will appear and I can change the color of the shape that I want. Let's go for something like, I don't know, blue and hit okay. Now I can draw my shape and show you what it looks like. All I have to do is click down and hold and drag and it'll create a rounded rectangle based off, you know, how big I want to draw it like this. And for this particular tool, I can actually change how round I want the corners of this rectangle to be. So as you can see, it's rounded on the corners, but if while I'm holding down and not letting go yet, I can hit the up arrow a 
few times, okay, just like that. I'm just gonna hold it actually. And you can see that it becomes more round. If I hold down, it'll make it less rounded like, th like that. In this case, I'm happy with something like this and I'll let go just like that. And a shape layer is created. As you can see on the timeline over here in your composition, there is now something called a shape layer one and the contents show that it's a rectangle. And this is a rounded rectangle. Now, if you've already let go, you made a shape and you're thinking, oh man, I, I gotta make a new one. I gotta delete this. That's gonna be a bit of a pain. Don't worry, you can change the parameters of this rectangle by hitting this arrow to show more options over here. Go to the rectangle path and then you can change the roundness over here. So don't worry, you can always make changes like this. And as you can see right next to the word roundness is a stopwatch. So if I were to click that, I can start keyframing it. But that's not what we're doing in this case. I just wanna show you that there are stopwatches next to certain parameters that you can animate. Now for the particular example that I'm using, I actually want a outline instead of a filled solid. So I'm gonna go back to stroke over here. I'm gonna click that once. And then we're going to go to solid color so that there will be a solid stroke. If I click OK, it just looks like it got a little bit bigger, but you can't really tell. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to turn off the visibility of the fill. So I'm gonna change the fill option to none, meaning that the inside of the shape won't be filled. I'm gonna hit OK. And as you can see, it's just the outline of that rounded rectangle that we drew. And congratulations guys, you just made your first shape, or in this case, an outline of the shape. Now this shape right now is kind of like off-centered slightly to the top of this composition as you can see and i want to talk to you about aligning things in your composition now there should be an align panel somewhere over here but if you don't see it which in this case i don't see it anywhere right now and even this double arrow where i can show more panels uh, I don't I don't really see a align panel. So if you ever don't see certain panels, you can go to the window option over here, click it once, and you can find all the panels that you can open up. In this case, I'm gonna click align. And as you can see, a new panel opens up next to paragraph called align. And if I click a layer like this, I can align it to the center of the composition. And right here it says align layers to the composition, which is exactly what we wanna do. And we're going to click this, which aligns it horizontally. So it'll be centered to the composition and then we're going to also align it vertically. So if I click that, it'll align it vertically to the composition. Now, this is a great example for me to refer back to the anchor point tool. As you can see, the anchor point right over here is not centered to the composition or to the layer. It's just kind of like off over here. So another quiz time. I feel like we're back in high school, but hopefully you've been paying attention. How do you move the anchor point back to the center of the layer? That's right, the shortcut is Control-Alt-Home. And as you can see, the anchor point goes back to the center over here. And that'll help if I wanted to scale this or rotate it and wanted to make sure that the anchor point was in the center while doing so. So far, you've been doing a great job if you followed along up until here because you've created a shape, but because we'll be making a message for when the button is pressed on the controller, we wanna add some text. And if you remember, how we create a text is by using the horizontal text tool over here, or you can hit the shortcut Control T and you can see that if I were to hover it over in parentheses, control T is the shortcut. So if I do that and I click to a space on the composition, it'll give me this red line, which shows me where the text will appear as I type. So I'll write something like Anish E A T. Oh my gosh. Whenever I'm recording the screen, I like forget how to spell. So hopefully you can bear with me. And to align this to the center, uh, what we can do is go back to the align panel over here and I click to align vertically like this. So now they are both aligned uh, to the center of the composition. Now, if I want to make any changes to the text over here, it will be under the character panel on the right over here. Now, this shows me the font that I'm using. In this case, I'm using one called Audio Wide. And then underneath are the you know subcategories for this font. Right now, there's only one option, which is regular. But if you have a different font selected, it might show you different options like bold or thin or italic. Now this one over here that shows the little t and the big t, this is to set the font size. Now I can either click the number over here and then input my own value. So right now it's 90, I can make it bigger and write like 100 and it'll make the text bigger. So I can either do that or I can click on the number, hold down and then move my mouse left and right. And that's a quick way for me to make it bigger or smaller like this. In this case, I'm gonna go back to 90 because I think that's actually a pretty good size. Now the rest of the tools over here, you can play around to find out what they do to affect your text. So, you know, for this one, I can space out the characters and set the tracking for the characters like this so I can space them out. And then there are other parameters to affect your text as well. But these are the kind of the main ones over here that will affect your text that you'll be using the most often. And then going back to the panel over here where it says align, there's also one that says paragraph, and there's another thing that can affect your text as well. It'll change how to align the paragraph and all these other parameters as well. So in this case, if I were to write like a lot of text, like, I don't know, let's just write some 
jumbled letters. Right now, it's aligned to the center, so it'll center the text. But if I were to you know, align it to the left like this, then all of it will align to the left, as you may have guessed. Same thing for the other one. You can align it to the right. But in this case, we're gonna keep it centered and we're gonna hit Control Z to undo that. So at this point, you've been making some significant progress and you wanna make sure that you don't lose it all because something can happen. What if your computer breaks down? What if a tornado strikes your house? Not going with, hopefully that doesn't happen, especially in the middle of this tutorial. But that's where saving your project file comes into play. So you can either go to File and then hit Save or you can hit the shortcut Control S and that'll save it to a new project file if you haven't made a new project file yet. And in this case, by default, it'll say untitled project. We'll call this uh, AE underscore be begin. Oh, this terrible typing again, tutorial <laughs> one, just like that. And then hit enter and it'll save it. And right on top over here, it'll show you where the file is located and what it's called. So every so often, it's good to hit control S really quickly to save your progress. And by default, After Effects will also generate auto saves for you in case something happens. If you're still keeping up with all this new knowledge I've been throwing at you, then congratulate yourself because you're doing an awesome job. And we're about to get into the even funner part, which is animating what you just made. If we were satisfied with it not moving, we'd be in something like Photoshop. But because we're in After Effects, let's add some movement to this graphic. For now, I'm gonna hide the text layer by hitting this I icon right over here like that so it only shows me the shape layer i can actually you know rename it to something like uh i'm gonna hit enter to rename and let's say rounded rectangle oh my now to create movement i'm gonna do exactly as i taught you earlier on creating keyframes so i'm gonna keyframe the position just like what i did before i'm gonna hit the shortcut p now that brings up the position parameter like this right over here i'm gonna hit the stopwatch and this is the final position that I want at around, you know, a second and 12 frames right now. I can always move this keyframe around as well by clicking it, holding it down, and then dragging it around. Um, let's say right over here. And then I'm gonna go to the very beginning and then I'm going to shift the position just like that. So it's just kind of touching the edge of frame. So again, anytime that you make changes to the layer uh, during different parts of the timeline, it'll automatically create a keyframe. So basically it's telling After Effects, hey, something is happening over here in this specific time spot. So if I were to hit spacebar to play this back, as you can see, it's this very sharp and robotic movement. Like I taught you earlier, we're going to easy ease these frames by highlighting them, hitting F9 like this, and then now it smoothens it out a little more. But we're going to further smoothen it out by highlighting one of the keyframes, going to the graph editor, as I showed you earlier. I'm going to drag the handle for the right keyframe over here, over to the left like this, so that it starts off a little bit faster and then feathers out and smoothens out to a slower stop. Uh, on the left side, I'm going to actually drag it like this so that it goes really fast and then slows down. So I'm gonna click the graph editor again so that I can see this normal timeline again. And I'm gonna play it from the very beginning. Now, I don't wanna to sidetrack too much, but you might be wondering that in this workspace, what is this green stuff happening? And why is it empty over here? There's some green over here. Like, what is this? What it is is the RAM cache. So it shows you which part is stored on your RAM for faster playback. So Basically, these parts that are, you know, not green right now, basically it's not stored on your RAM yet. So if I were to hit spacebar, it might take a little bit of time to RAM preview where it will store the preview onto your RAM. So when it's all green like this, it'll mean that it'll play just fine, very smooth, and you won't have some choppy playback. And if you ever find that your computer's slowing down a little bit and it's really hard on your RAM, you can always purge whatever's stored on your RAM right now by going to edit, purge, and then all memory and disk cache. And it'll show you how much space you can delete off your disk cache. So I can hit okay. And as you can see, it all goes gray, except for this one frame that the playhead is sitting on. And we're just gonna go back to the very beginning over here. And then we're just gonna hit spacebar again, where it will play back uh, quite smoothly. But that is how you play back your video and make sure that it plays smooth and it's not playing like super choppy or anything like that. Or if that were to happen, you know exactly what it could be. So right now we only have the position of our shape animated, but Although we hid our text layer, we haven't forgotten about it. Let's turn it back on by hitting the eye icon like this. And it's not animated because we haven't set any keyframes to it. And instead of adding keyframes to that text layer, what we can do is parent the layer to the shape layer. And how you can do that is by clicking this pick whip. This one that looks like a swirl right over here is this parent pick whip. I'm gonna hold it down. I'm gonna drag it over to the rectangle layer because that's the one with the keyframes. And I'm gonna let go. And as you can see in the box over here, it says, the name of the layer that it's parented to. So the parent layer is the shape layer and the child layer is now the text layer. Basically, the child has to listen to the parent. So if the parent layer is keyframed and moves around, then the text layer 
will follow it, as you can see when I'm scrubbing through the playhead. And if I were to hit spacebar, boom, the text follows the shape layer. Now, this is really useful if you have like multiple layers. Let's say that I have like, you know, a bunch of text layers like this. So parenting them all to one layer that has the keyframes and it's animated will save you time from having the keyframe each and every one of these layers. So I'm just gonna undo that. And parenting only works for transformation options like position, scale, and rotation. So that's something that you'll wanna keep in mind. Now we're gonna be parenting something later again in the tutorial, so try your best not to forget about this feature. All right, so our shape and our text is now animated, and what we're gonna learn next is how to pre-compose your layers. Now, what is pre-composing? What that means is it's going to basically group the layers into its own composition. So what I'll do is I'll highlight the layers that I wanna pre-compose, which are these two right over here, the text layer and the shape layer. I'm going to hit the shortcut Control shift c and it'll bring up this window which says pre-compose and I can change the name of the composition. In this case, I'll call it a pop-up like this. And then we're going to make sure that we move all the attributes into the new composition. And basically once I hit okay, it's going to create this composition called pop-up. And inside that composition, I'm gonna double click it so I can open it up. And as you can see, a new tab opens up next to the main composition we were working in. And in that composition is now the text and the rectangle. So this is a really useful feature if you want to keep your composition neat and tidy without like a bunch of layers in one composition. And this is also useful if you want to apply effects or do certain things to everything that was pre-composed. As an example, let's do the next step. I'm gonna go back to the main composition by clicking the tab over here like this. And as you can see in the timeline, we have the pop-up composition that we pre-composed and also the footage layer that we are hiding the visibility of, so we can't see it yet. Now with the pop-up layer highlighted and selected like this, I'm gonna take one of the shape tools. Uh, I'm just gonna keep it to the rounded rectangle tool and we're going to draw a mask around our pre-comp. Pre-comp is short for pre-composition. Now remember how we use this tool to draw this uh, rounded rectangle earlier? When we highlight a layer and we have the shape tool selected, it allows you to draw a mask and masking lets you choose which specific parts of the layer you want to be visible. So in this case, we'll draw one that's around the graphic like this. And basically everything within this mask will be visible. So I'm just gonna go to the beginning over here. And if I play that back by hitting spacebar, as you can see, it's basically hidden so that we don't see anything that's outside of this mask, just like that. And I don't have to use the shape tool. I can hit control Z so that we don't have a mask anymore. I can actually use the pen tool as well to draw a shape. And with the layer selected, as you can see, it's highlighted. I can also just, you know, draw a shape like this and then close it off like that. And that creates a mask as well. So if I were to play it from the beginning, if I just scrub through it, as you can see, that line is kind of that dividing point where everything within that mask will show up. And if I wanted to invert this, so basically everything past that line uh, outside of that mask would be visible, then instead of this being add right now, so this is the mask that was created. It's called mask one right now. Right now it's set to add so that everything within the mask is showing up. If I click that and then click subtract, everything outside of that mask will show up. So once it goes into that mask that we drew, it just becomes invisible. So in this case, I'm gonna delete that mask just like that. I'm gonna go back to the rounded rectangle tool just as a bit of a refresher. And I'm gonna draw the area that I want to show that's visible. And masking is one of those essential tools that I use for basically 100% of what I do in After Effects. Now I'm noticing that this animation is a little bit slow. It's like a slow slide in kind of deal. And I want it to be happening a little bit faster. So what I can do is go back to the pre-comp. So I can click the tab over here that says pop up or I can double click this, doesn't matter. It'll bring me back to this composition. And then I'm going to highlight the rounded rectangle tool, hit P to bring up the position because that's the one that I keyframed. And I'm going to just drag this keyframe so that the end position will reach sooner. So if I play this back, it'll be a little bit faster. Let's actually make it a little bit faster like this. And because this text layer is parented over here, I don't have to change any other keyframes other than this one over here. And that's another very convenient result of parenting things. So I'm happy with the speed. Let's go back to the main comp and I can see how it looks like with it masked as well. So with our basic animation complete, let's have it stick onto the controller on the footage that I just hit. So let's turn that visibility back on. And this is the controller that I'm talking about. And we're gonna try and stick this animation onto this. So see how the controller is moving around? We're gonna make it so that it follows along the controller. Now, you know about keyframing positions, but thankfully we don't have to manually shift the positions of the graphic frame by frame because 
Can you imagine how painful that would be? I'm gonna teach you the simplest way to track in After Effects using the built-in tracker. And basically we're going to track the movement of the controller and then have this graphic follow it along. Now, when you become a bit more experienced, I recommend using a built-in plugin called Mocha AE for more accurate tracking and for more tools. But for pretty simple tracking jobs where there's not like huge motion or anything like that, then using the one in After Effects is just fine. So I'm gonna hide this graphic layer for now. So I'm gonna turn off the visibility so I can just pay attention to this footage. And with this footage layer highlighted like this, we're gonna to go to the tracking panel. It should be on the right over here, but I don't see it. So remember how we can bring up windows that we don't see is by going to the window up top over here. And then we're going to go to tracker and once I click that it'll show up this panel on the bottom right and this is your tracker panel and what we'll be doing is tracking the motion so we're going to hit track motion like this and it'll bring up a new window now remember in the preview window uh, it was showing our composition but right now this is actually not the composition that we're looking at as you can see it's a new tab next to the composition and this is the layers source footage so we're not looking at the composition and you're not going to see any effects that have been applied to it you're just looking at the footage layer and here is where we have our first tracking point over here and as you can see back onto the panel over here right now it's tracking just the position but if we look back at this uh, footage over here it kind of rotates a little bit as you can see to the right and then to the left and we're making it a little bit tricky for ourselves so what we can do is also track the rotation so if i hit that you're going to notice that there are now two tracking points like this and let me talk about what these tracking points are and how to use them so let's just focus on tracking point one so zooming in just like this you're going to notice that each tracking point will have two tracking boxes now the inner box right over here with the cross in the middle that's going to determine the particular area which you want to track the motion of and the outer box will help search for the tracking point through each frame of the footage so we're going to zoom out and we're going to find a point for the area that we want to track. So in this case, I'm going to click down and drag over this box over to this area because I feel like this is a pretty big spot for it to track. And I think that might do for this example. So I'm just gonna uh, stretch it out like that. And then I'm going to move the box so that it fits in the parameters of this light. And then I can make this second box a little bit bigger, like so, and I'll just kind of search within that area. And we have the second tracking point, and it's basically the same thing, but I need to find another point so I can determine the rotation. So in this case, another thing that doesn't quite move around is my finger. But in your case, whatever footage that you're using, you kind of want to use something that's around the same area. So in this case, something like this button would work really good because it's part of the controller, and this, is, this first tracking point is also attached to the controller, so that would work fine. But for this particular footage, it's actually not good because in the beginning over here, I kind of block the button over here. So it's going to have some trouble tracking it. So I'm going to go back over here. I'm going to move that tracking point over to my finger over here because my finger has been staying on the controller the entire time. And I'm just going to have it track my finger like that. So I have two tracking points. So once you're happy with the positions of your tracking points, what you can do now is go back to the panel over here and you can analyze your footage. And as you can see, it says analyze over here and you can click these buttons. And what it will basically do is create keyframes for every frame and track the area that you've determined with your boxes. So what you can do is you can analyze backwards like this or you can analyze forward, or you can analyze frame by frame. So you can click this one to analyze one frame forward or one frame backwards. So in this case, my playhead is right over here, right? So I'm gonna need to analyze backwards for the rest of the footage. And then I'm gonna have to go back over here and analyze forward as well. So I'm going to first analyze backwards and let After Effects work hard and create its keyframes. So I'm gonna hit spacebar to stop it because as you can see here, the tracking points get a little wonky and it basically slips off and drifts off the point of where I want to track because the controller starts going out of focus. But because my animation isn't going to be coming uh, in at this point, I don't need to worry about this. But I do want to quickly touch on how you can adjust your tracking points. So if something like this happens where it slips off whatever you're tracking, you can manually change the uh, position. So in this case, I can just drag it over back to the finger like this. I can drag this box over so that it fits the light just like that. And then that'll fix the position. So you can do this frame by frame and how you can move frame by frame instead of dragging this playhead left and right. A quick shortcut is to hit page up like this to go a frame backwards or page down to go forwards. So I'm gonna hit page up so I can go back. And as you can see, the tracking box is nowhere near 
this light because it's out of focus. So it's giving it a hard time and it doesn't know what to do. So we're gonna move it manually like this, move this back to the finger. And as you can see, if I play it back and forth, it follows the movement because we're manually moving the boxes, but I'm not gonna do it for the rest of the footage because like I said, I'm not gonna be having the animation happen during that time. But if you ever find yourself in that situation, you now know how to do it. So I wanna find the point where I can start analyzing forward. Now I can either play and then, you know, find the point where it stops moving around, or I can go to the layer over here and I can hit U. And the shortcut U will show you all the things that have keyframes. So in this case, I have two tracking points and it's showing all the keyframes that it has made so far. So I can go back to the point over here where there's no more keyframes going forward and I can go back to the panel over here so that I can analyze forward. And then once I click it, After Effects continues to work hard and analyze the rest of the footage. Awesome, so I can see that the playhead is all the way to the end and I've got all these lovely keyframes, so it is done analyzing. I'm gonna highlight the layer, I'm gonna hit U again so that I don't see all those keyframes. It gets a little overwhelming and intimidating seeing all those keyframes sometimes. And I'm gonna go to an empty spot on my composition. I'm going to right click and I'm gonna go to new and then I'm gonna go to null object. I'm gonna click that and it's gonna create a null object. Now what this is, is an invisible layer that you can set properties to and then parent other layers to it. So in this case, we're gonna transfer all the tracking data over to the null object. So over in the tracker panel, right over here, we're going to click edit target. So that's going to change where we want to apply all the keyframes to. And we're gonna change it to null number one. That's our null object. And then we're gonna hit okay. And then we're ready to click apply. And that's, as I said before, apply all the keyframes. And we're gonna make sure that it will apply the X and the Y axis. Now you can always change this to X only or Y only, but in this case, we wanna make sure that it follows along with the movement of it moving up and down and left and right. So we're gonna hit okay. And then now, as you can see on this null object, there's a bunch of this tracking data. And then we can rename this to something like tracking. Oh my, I need to start a counter on how many times I misspell things. And then now all we're gonna do is we're going to enable the visibility of our pop-up layer right over here, there's our animation. And we're gonna find a point like over here. And then we're going to parent the layer over to the null object, that tracking layer. And by letting go, just like that, I can play through and scrub through. And as you can see, the movement of the graphic follows the movement of the controller that we tracked earlier. Pretty amazing, right? And definitely beats keyframing frame by frame. So I'm gonna hide whatever's showing me in this tracking layer right over here. And I'm gonna click the pop-up layer. I'm gonna hit S, which will bring up the scale. That's a shortcut for bringing up scale. And we're going to rescale it so it's a little bit smaller. And we're going to just drag it over so it's closer to the controller like this. And if we play it through, it's now looking a little bit better. And I wanna make sure that the animation happens when I click down onto the button. So that's when the message should be appearing. So something like right over here, I'm going to play through, boom. That's when the message comes up. Pretty cool, right? But something does look kind of off about this animation. Now it's not really facing the same way as this controller. As you can see, the controller is angled slightly off. Meanwhile, our graphic is facing towards camera and straight on. So what we're gonna do is change this layer this pop-up layer into a 3D object. Now, I won't be covering much about 3D objects in After Effects, but I will be touching the very basics of it. So how you turn this into a 3D object is by going to this column over here. So this is the 3D layer. So as you can see, read the description, it says that it allows the layer to be manipulated in three dimensions. So going down that column, you wanna make sure that you click that checkbox and that will enable some new parameters over here. Now, if I just close this, and open it again. You can see that there are more numbers to work with. Now, if you're like me and you're not good at math and you don't like looking at numbers all the time, this can be a little bit overwhelming. But luckily there's not too much that's different. What we wanna play around here with is the rotation. We wanna rotate it so it's facing somewhat the same angle as the controller. And what we can do is hit R and that's a shortcut for rotation. So as a bit of a recap for shortcuts, P will bring up position, S will bring up scale, and then R will bring up rotation. And instead of just one parameter of rotation that we can change, we can now rotate on three different axes. The X rotation, which will rotate kind of like this, as you can see from the preview window. And then we can also animate from the Y axis like this. And we can also rotate on the Z axis. So in this case, we're trying to angle it so slightly uh, in the same angle as the controller. So I think that's the Y rotation. That's the one I'll play with. And I can just angle it slightly off, kind of like this, and then make a bit of a readjustment 
on my Z axis like so. And I can always move this down a little bit by dragging onto the green arrow over here. And I suggest that if you ever move things around in 3D space to drag it from the arrows instead of like dragging it like this. Otherwise some weird things can happen. So in this case, I'm just going to shift it down by the Y axis so I can have it aligned with the controller so that I can kind of fine tune it and make sure that it's closer to being aligned. And then I can just move it back to where it was before like this. And I'm pretty happy with this. I think this looks pretty good. Hit control S so I can save my progress and make sure that nothing bad happens. Now for this particular footage and this graphic, as you can see, it kind of doesn't stick very well with the controller. And that's just because the footage that I'm using doesn't give a lot of points that give you a great track. But as you can still see, After Effects does a pretty good job. It does most of the bulk work. So I wanna make sure that the end position over here matches the controller. And how I'm gonna do that is by keyframing. So I'm gonna to look to the point where it looks pretty normal. So kind of over here, this is still okay. I'm going to click the layer, the pop-up layer over here, hit P to bring up the position. And I'm gonna hit the stopwatch. So I create a keyframe over here. And I'm also going to change the rotation. Now, if I want to show the position and the rotation at the same time, because if I were to hit R right now, it'll just show me the rotations, but I don't see the position anymore. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit P again so I can see the position. I'm gonna hold down Shift and I'm gonna hit R. And then now that'll bring up the rotation parameters along with the position right over here. So that can come pretty handy if you wanna look at more parameters at the same time. So I'm gonna keyframe the Z rotation as well by hitting the stopwatch. And as you can see, two keyframes are created over here. This one for the position, this one for the Z rotation. I'm gonna move forward to the point where it looks kind of off, which is kind of like over here. And I'm going to just kind of rotate it back so it's aligned with the controller. And then I'm going to move the pop-up so it's aligned more centered to the controller as well. And then I'm just going to highlight them, hit F9 so I easy ease the movement in case it's any sharp movement that I don't want. And then if I play it through, it's aligned a little bit better. Now it looks like there's some movement over here, which I don't really want. So I'm gonna move these keyframes kind of like around here. And that looks a little more natural. So I'm gonna zoom back out and I'm gonna see if anything weird looks like it happens. I think it's actually kind of off over here. So I'm going to move these keyframes by just dragging it kind of like this. And as you can see, that's how easy it is to shift your keyframes around, just highlight them and then Move them. And if I play it through, look at that. You've essentially done the bulk work in making a sick animation that is tracked to your object. So I congratulate you if you've made it this far because you've learned most of the tools you'll be using on a regular basis. But we're not quite done yet. We still wanna add some things to actually make it look good. So the next thing I wanna talk about are blending modes. Now, blending modes control how each layer will blend with the layers underneath. And how you change the blending mode for a layer is that if you don't see a window that gives you that option, what you can do is click this button that says toggle switches and modes. And when you click that, it'll show you some new parameters over here. And as you can see, this says mode, which is your blending modes. And you go to the layer that you wanna change the blending mode of, which in this case is the pop-up composition. When I click that normal, and you'll see all these words, and boy, there are a lot of them. But I'm gonna break down the ones you'll be using the most. But to break things down simply, without going too much into detail of each blending mode, I'm gonna break them down into different sections, at least the ones you'll be using most often. And you'll also notice that there's this gray dividing line between certain sections as well. So starting from here, where it starts with darken all the way to darker color, these basically make the brighter parts of your layer transparent. From add to lighter color, right over here, this section, this will make the darker parts transparent. And then starting from overlay over to hard mix, this section over here, it'll make the grays transparent. And then starting from difference to divide, this will display the difference between the colors and the tones of your layer. Now in this case, we're going to hit screen like that, and as you can see, basically it makes it look a little bit translucent and brightens up the parts over here where it overlaps with the finger. So I'm gonna hit Control Z so you can see the difference. And then Control Shift Z will redo what I did. So you compare the two. And giving it that translucent look makes it look a little more like a hologram. And if you're ever not sure of which blending mode you should use, you can always experiment to see which gives you the best result. And a quick way to do that is by having the layer highlighted like this, and then hold down shift and hit the subtract or plus button. And what this does is it will go down the list of blending modes so you can see which one gives you the best results. 
But in this case, I'm going to go back to screen because I think that's what's going to be most appropriate for this. And for a cool holographic effect like this, it's only natural that the graphic would glow if it's light being projected from the controller. And as the name After Effects implies, you can add some effects to help you do this. Now we're going to go to an effects and presets panel. And as I mentioned before, if you don't see it, it's usually on the right side. You can go to window and then you can go to effects and presets like this and it'll bring up this new panel over here and you can search up an effect that you can apply from After Effects. In this case, we're gonna add a glow. So we're gonna type that in and we're gonna scroll down until we find the one that is under stylized and it says glow. And we're going to click that, we're gonna hold it down, we're gonna drag it over to the layer that we want to apply the effect to. In this case, the pop-up layer. So I'm gonna let go. And then a new panel shows up on the left side over here. It's right next to the project panel. And this effects control panel will show all the effects that have been applied to the layer. And in this case, it's just the glow. Now under glow, there are a lot of parameters that you can change. But in this case, all we're going to do is we're going to play with the glow radius and that'll determine how far it'll spread. So that looks pretty good. And then we can change the glow intensity as well kind of like that. So I'm going to adjust it until it looks pretty good like this. And that gives a soft glow. And the trick to having a really good glow is by actually duplicating the effect. So I'm going to hit control D while I have the effect highlighted and it will make a second glow like this. And this is looking a little bit bright, but what we're going to do is we're going to increase the glow radius like this, and then we're going to bring down the glow intensity. So basically it gives a softer spread to the glow. And then we can always adjust this a little bit and then I can duplicate it one more time. So I have three glows and I'm going to increase the glow radius even more and bring down the glow intensity. So now if I zoom out, as you can see, there's quite a nice glow on this graphic that we created. So if I play it through from the beginning, this is what it looks like. Now one detail you should definitely remember is how to enable motion blur. Now, depending on what you do, enabling motion blur can give it a more natural look. So I'm gonna go back to the pop-up composition. That's right over here. And if I play this through, it's looking really clean, right? Now, if I add a motion blur, this is what it'll end up looking like. So I'm going to go to the column over here that says motion blur, okay? It's like a bunch of circles and a diagonal like this, and I'm going to enable both of them. And a quick way for me to do that without clicking them individually, by the way, so I'm gonna unclick it, is if I click and hold down and then drag my mouse down and then let go, it'll highlight everything towards the direction that I bring my cursor to. So in this case, both of them are enabled. And although motion blur is enabled on these layers, you wanna make sure that it is actually enabled by having this icon highlighted blue like this. So if I turn that off, it will disable motion blur. So even though it's toggled on these layers, you won't be able to see it, but I wanna make sure it's actually highlighted. And then if I play it from the beginning like this, you can see that there's a bit of a blur during the motion of the graphic that's moving upwards. So if I just scrub through it, as you can see, there's a bit of a blur, right? And it basically replicates the blur that would happen in real life if there's motion happening in front of you. Now, if I go back to the main composition and I want to enable motion blur for this pop-up layer, and I don't see that window. Remember, we can click the button, toggle switches and modes, and then we can look for that icon right over here, this column, click that, and that'll enable motion blur for this composition as well. So if I play it through from the beginning, boom, there's a bit of a blur and it's a really nice detail to make your animation look more realistic. As you can see, if I zoom in, because it's rotating along with the controller, there's a bit of a blur along that motion now. Now, as I mentioned before, if you ever want to make changes to your animation or add more elements to your animation, then you can go back to the pre-comp, make any changes without affecting the glow or the tracking data. So in this case, let's say that I wanted to change the color of this rounded rectangle. So right now it's blue. Let's make it something like, I don't know, like orange like this and hit okay. So now it's an orange outline, but if I go back to the main composition, it also changes to orange and the glow and the tracking is still applied to the pre-comp. Now in this pre-comp, you can also add more shapes or text or import other footage or animations that you have. In this case, I'm gonna be adding some animations from my motion graphic pack that I handcrafted called Enter the Future. It includes a variety of assets you can use for your music videos, commercials, live streams, narrative films, you name it. It also comes with a tutorial on how to use it even if you're a beginner in After Effects. So if you need transitions, borders, or custom text animations to give your video a modern edge, I recommend checking it out. So a quick recap on how to import things. You can just highlight whatever that you want and then you can just drag and drop it into your project. And then we're gonna drag that into a folder like this on the folder icon and then call it 
enter the future assets like this. And then while I'm making new folders, I can also highlight these two, put it in a new folder and call it compositions like this. Nice and neat. So in this case, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller so I have more room to drop in more things. I'm gonna hit S so I can rescale it down like this. And then of course that'll affect this as well, but that's okay. And then I'm going to drop something like uh, this loading bar over onto my timeline, or I can directly drop it onto my composition like this. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna trim the layer so it starts over here where it says 0% by hitting Alt, left bracket, like that. So it'll appear during that time, right? And then I can shift this over so it happens a little bit earlier. I'm gonna have it happen right when this initiating box is about to stop. And then I'm going to rescale it so it's just kind of like over here on the top right corner. And actually, instead of having it appear suddenly like this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keyframe the opacity. So remember the shortcut for that is T, T for opacity. And then we're going to hit the stopwatch. So right now it's at 100%, but I'm going to actually have it kind of like flicker in. So I'm gonna go one frame back like this and change the opacity to 50%. Go back one more and then go back to 100 like this. Go, go back one, go to zero go back one more and then go to 100. So what happens is that at the beginning of this clip, it will be at 100% opacity, it'll go to zero, then 100, then 50, then 100. So if I play this through, it looks like it flickers on. And I can always move these keyframes over a little bit like this, and then trim the layer by dragging it from the edge like so, and then move the layer so all of this happens as soon as that comes to a stop, like this. So this is what my animation looks like so far. Now I'm gonna see which one I want to use next. And if I want to preview it and have it play back because I don't remember how the asset looks like, I can double click it like this, and then it'll open up a new tab right over here. And as I mentioned before, this shows the source footage. So I can see that this plays back and this is what it looks like. Let's load up another one like over here and let's use this one. So I'm gonna go back to my composition window right over here. I'm gonna drop in this animation like this, hit S so I can rescale it. Because I think this is looking a little bit too big and then I'm going to align it kind of like over here. Now because this is like really long and I kind of want to keep everything contained over here, I'm going to mask the area that I actually want to keep visible. So I guess this whole section of the tutorial is a good recap of all the tools that we were using earlier. So I'm going to go to the shape tool like this. Right now it's the rounded rectangle tool which is totally fine and I'm going to draw a rectangle around where I want to keep which I think something like this is okay. And I think I'm going to hit V. So I go back to the selection tool and then I'm gonna move that inside over here. And I can always scale down the animation kind of like this. And I can always make changes to the mask. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna double click on one of these points like this and it will select the entire mask. And I can drag this over like so. Drag it over to the other end like this. And if it's not lining up to the edges of this border over here, I can have it so that it's underneath the rounded rectangle like this. Because remember, the visibility goes from top to bottom. So because this rounded rectangle is on top of this tape layer, as you can see, it's basically stacked on top and it doesn't show the edges of that tape animation anymore. Now, because this is over here, I'm going to move the initiating text up top like this. So it fills up the space a little bit nicer. Now, if I play it through, as you can see, the tape animation does not follow the box. So can you guess what we're gonna do next? That's right, we are going to parent it over to the rectangle like this by holding onto the parent pick whip and dragging it over to the rectangle like so. And then now it follows the box. So that's essentially how you make adjustments in your pre-comp. And then if I go back to the main composition, and as you can see, the new elements are showing up. So the next animation that I'm gonna drop in is this I one, and I'm just gonna quickly reposition it and rescale it and not go too into detail with the tools you already know. And as I mentioned before, you can also add in graphics as well, or still images. So these animations are .mov files, as you can see the extension over here, but this one is a PNG file, so it's a still image. I'm gonna drop it in, and it works the same way. All I have to do is reposition it to something else, and then I'm going to hit R, so I can bring up the rotation, and I can change it to something like 90 degrees, hit S again and rescale it, and then just get it to something that I'm happy with, and just put it right over here, like that. And if I feel like this is a little bit distracting, I can always hit T. So I bring in my opacity and let's change it to something like 20%. So it's really subtle. And the only accent color here is this orange and it's only happening with this box over here. But if I wanna change the color of this eye, for example, I can add an effect called tint. So remember how you apply effects? 
you go to the effects and presets panel over here. I'm gonna change that so that it says tint like that. And then under color correction tint, I can take that, I can hold it down and drag it over to the eye over here. And that'll open up this effects control panel. And for this particular effect, we're gonna map the white. So everything that's white in this animation, we're gonna change it to this color over here. How I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna click this eyedropper tool. If I click it once, basically it's going to choose the color that it wants to change it to, which in this case is the color of this box. If I click it, just like that, it changes the eye to orange. Now, right now, as you can see, it's not animated. So I'm gonna have it kind of flicker in just like this loading bar. And the nice thing about keyframes is that you can copy and paste them over to different layers as well. So I'm gonna click this loading bar layer hit T so I can bring up these keyframes. I'm gonna highlight these keyframes by clicking down onto an empty space, dragging over them so I can highlight them so that they're all blue. Hit Control C so I can copy it. And then I'm going to go to the I layer over here and then hit Control V and I paste the parameters. Now you don't see them right now because the opacity isn't opened up. So I'm gonna hit T and then now I can just drag them over so that it either matches over here or have it offset just a little bit like that. So as you can see, the eye animation flickers, but I'm gonna trim it so that it happens around here. As for the still image right over here, I'm gonna apply the same thing. I'm gonna hit Control V, okay? And I'm gonna make sure that the end opacity over here is set to whatever I had before. I think it was something like 30 or maybe 20, and then trim the layer just like what I did. And then we'll just kind of offset it a little bit, kind of like this. So now when I zoom out and then play from the very beginning, they just kind of flicker in. And I can always readjust the time for these layers by highlighting all of them and just clicking and dragging them over so that they appear a little bit sooner. So once I'm happy with this, I can go back to the main composition and see how it looks. And as you can see, this eye is kind of chopped off. And the reason is because we have a mask over our pre-comp. So if I select that, and then I can see this pink mask over here. I can click the points that I want to move. So in this case, I'm clicking this point. And then if I want to click this one as well, then I have to hold down shift and then I can select multiple points. In this case, just these two are highlighted right now. And I'm just gonna shift it up a little bit so that we can see the eye just like that. Now it's a little bit bright, so I'm just going to change the opacity for that by hitting T, go to like 95%, still looking a little bright. Let's go to 85%. Now this is looking like it's a part of the scene. And then we'll scale it a little bit bigger because we scaled down earlier in our pre-comp. So if you're at a point where you are pleased with all the hard work that you put in and you wanna actually have a video file, you can upload it and share it with all your friends on YouTube or Instagram or something. Then how we do that is by exporting our composition into a video file. How we do that is that within the composition over here, we're gonna hit the shortcut Control M and that'll bring up a new tab over here called the render queue. And this is the composition that will be exported, otherwise known as rendering. So rendering and exporting basically means the same thing in this case. And then you can change some of these options over here. So render settings, right now it's at best settings. I don't need to touch that. For output module though, I can click this arrow and it'll show me some more options that I can pick from and basically have the video file in different qualities. But in this case, I'm going to click away. I'm gonna click the name of it and that'll bring up this output module settings. And all this can look pretty confusing at first. And there are a lot of export settings depending on what kind of quality you're looking for for your video. Now, a format that kind of retains the quality quite well is something like this, QuickTime, under this menu. And then format options, and you can click something like animation and that does a really good job in retaining the best quality of your video. And you can hit OK and hit OK again. And the thing about having high quality videos is that it'll take more space. It'll be a pretty big file. And if you're uploading something to the web like YouTube or Facebook, then you can export to something that isn't as high quality because YouTube will automatically compress whatever you upload anyways. It'll just kind of dumb down the quality. So what I like to do is cue it in AME which stands for Adobe Media Encoder. It's a separate program that will open up and then you can export from there. But if you click it and it doesn't open up, then maybe you haven't set your output to location. So this is basically where you want to output the video file to. So if I click the name over here, so in this case, I'm gonna to go to the exports folder over here and then I'm going to rename it to something like AE Beginner Tutorial Export like this. Hit safe and then I'm gonna hit the button Q in AME and then this window will pop up which is Adobe Media Encoder and then I have something that looks like my render queue earlier uh, but I have it set to H.264. Now I'm gonna click one of these parameters uh, like this one over here. It might give you this window where it's basically 
loading up the information from After Effects. And then we open up this window and there's a lot of parameters that you can change. And I'm not gonna go through each and every one of these, but to give you a good video file setting that you can upload straight onto something like YouTube, having the format to H.264 is a good standard. You can change the preset as well. Uh, and although there are a lot of options, you can just choose high bitrate. And under the basic video settings, as you can see, it's grayed out. Unless you were to uncheck it, then you can change it. But this is the resolution of the video that will be exported. There's the frame rate and then all these other parameters that you can kind of ignore. And then you can just hit OK. And to have it actually export, you're going to have to press this green play button over here on the right. And that will start the queue. We're going to click it once. And as you can see, it is rendering with this nice blue loading bar. And as you can see over here, there's a nice green check mark and the status is done. So I can click that once and that will open up the folder that the video file is saved in. And then as you can see, it is a .mp4 file, which is a video file that you can do whatever you want with it. So I can double click it and you can admire the results of your amazing progress today. Congratulations, guys. If you have made it this far, it means that you are now equipped with the most basic knowledge of After Effects. All those gray boxes and buttons don't look as intimidating anymore, huh? As you can see, there are a lot of different tools that help you accomplish what you need in After Effects. Now, this particular application you learned today where you track a pop-up animation to an object can be useful if you're doing a product video that requires some cool text callouts or if you want to show a message pop-up from someone's phone. Now, the possibilities are endless and only limited by your imagination. You can actually put After Effects as a skill on your resume without lying anymore because you graduated from the Herman's After Effects Beginners course. All right, maybe I'm making it sound a little fancier than it actually is, but everything that you continue to learn about After Effects from now on will depend on the fundamental knowledge that you learn today. The way I learned After Effects wasn't from school or from a course, but from YouTube videos and tutorials like this one. And if you want to improve quickly, my number one piece of advice is to keep applying what you learn over and over again. Yes, you have made a sick animation today that you should be proud of, but it's only the beginning of many things that I hope you'll be creating in After Effects. Each time you make a new thing, just reapply the shape tool, the text tool, tracking, masking, keyframing, etc. That way it becomes just another language to you and you don't even need to think about how to use these tools anymore so you can focus on creating even more amazing things. Not sure if all that made sense, but I hope it helps and that this tutorial helped you as well. As I mentioned before, if you'd like some sick motion graphic elements to add to your videos and make yourself look like a pro right away, check out my pack called Enter the Future. You can click the little pop-up for more information, uh, but it's something that I made for creators like you to give your videos a modern edge. If you'd like to see more content like this from Josh, myself, or other instructors on the channel, then make sure that you subscribe to the Olufemi channel and click the bell notification so you don't miss the next video. Also, drop a link in the comments below of the video that you made after watching this tutorial so that everyone can check it out or drop a comment of what you would like to make in after Effects. And if you want to stay in touch or see what I'm personally up to, uh, check out my Instagram. The handle is at coffee liquor. That is it guys. Again, my name is Herman and I'll see you in the next video.